So it's ceramics. Uh, ceramics are traditionally defined as inorganic, non-metallic solids prepared from powders that are usually mixed with water and then heated. So they're used in making bricks, tiles, pottery dishes, insulating elements, all kinds of stuff. You probably have a lot of different ceramics in your home. Typical properties of ceramics, they're hard, they're strong, they do not conduct electricity, and they're brittle. You hit them with a hammer, they're going to shatter into small pieces. There are different types of ceramics. Um, so silicate ceramics have silicates in them. Aluminosilicates are silicates that have some of the silicon atoms replaced with aluminum. So they've got aluminum and silicon in there. These are naturally occurring, and when they weather, um, the powdered forms get mixed with water, and that forms clay. If you heat it, we get a reaction, reactions occurring that form the ceramic. So ceramics are formed from clay, but clay is not a ceramic. The clay kaolinite has this um, empirical formula, two aluminums, two silicons, five oxygens, and four OH groups. When you heat that above 1,500 degrees Celsius, it undergoes irreversible chemical and structural changes to give you a, a white ceramic solid with a network of silicon oxygen and aluminum oxygen tetrahedra. Kaolinite is the most important component in porcelain. Porcelain things we often re refer to as China. It originated in China. Um, think, you know, your good China that you might use for Christmas, the white, white plates with the pretty flowers on them, right? It's a very fine um, ceramic solid, and um, it can be, there, there's a whole science and art in making porcelain because, yes, it's mostly this kaolinite, but then if you add other things in, you can change the quality of the porcelain. There are also oxide ceramics. These do not have silicon in them. These include um, aluminum oxide and magnesium oxide. They're physically and chemically stable at really high temperatures, and so that makes them useful in industrial furnaces, um, in high-speed cutting tools again, in crucibles. Remember the crucibles that we carried around? Um, and heating elements and fireproofing. So they've got a lot of practical uses. And then there are also non-oxide ceramics. These uh, silicon nitride, boron nitride, and silicon carbide. Notice there's no oxygen in these guys. So silicon nitride um, has a structure similar to silica, but it's silicon and nitrogen instead of silicon and oxygen. It's used in engine parts um, for making non-metallic ball bearings. Boron nitride. Boron nitride is kind of neat because um, it has the same electrons as carbon-2. Two. two carbon atoms together would have how many valence electrons? Eight. Well, boron has one fewer protons and electrons than carbon, and nitrogen has one more. And so if you put one boron and one nitrogen together, you have the same number of electrons as two carbon atoms. And so it's going to form... Uh, structures that are similar to those that carbon forms, including layered sheets like graphite and diamond structures. So it's used in high temperature lubricants, abrasives, and cutting tools. And then there's silicon carbide. This has a diamond structure, but instead of um, all carbon atoms like diamond, half of the carbon atoms are replaced by silicon atoms. So. It's a diamond that's half silicon and half carbon. That, of course, changes its appearance and some of its properties. It's useful as abrasives, uh, high temperature materials, and as an additive to steel. Any questions? And we get to cement. Um, cement was first discovered by the Romans. And they mixed lime, volcanic ash, and clay with water and made a pourable slurry. And then when that hardened, it was like a rock. And so that's pretty neat. Uh, Portland cement is a specific type of cement. It has nothing to do with Portland, Oregon. Um, it's a powdered mixture, um, mostly limestone, calcium carbonate, silica, which we've talked about, alumina, Al2O3, 
iron, three oxide, and gypsum. And those are all mixed together in a specific ratio. And then you add water, and it undergoes a series of complex reactions that give you a rock-like substance. This is different than a ceramic. What did we have to do to, to cure a ceramic? You have to heat it. Cements will cure at room temperature. The chemical reactions will occur at room temperature. Um, clays can also harden, but they harden by just losing water, whereas a cement is actually undergoing chemical reactions. You get silicon oxygen, silicon bridges forming in that structure, and you get this fibrous structure that's very hard and strong. Concrete. I know I personally often use concrete and cement interchangeably. They're not actually the same thing. Concrete is cement mixed with sand and gravel or pebbles. It's the most widely used building material in the world. We're all familiar with concrete, right? The sidewalks, this building, all over the place. It dramatically revolutionized construction. This was a big deal, a big development when concrete came into use. About half of all man-made structures are made out of concrete. There's just a lot of concrete around. Glass. Glass is another covalent atomic solid. Um, so if you take silica and melt it, it melts about uh, 1,500 degrees. If you cool it quickly, the silicon and oxygen atoms are going to form an amorphous structure rather than a crystalline structure. And that is called glass. So silicate glass is transparent, impervious to water, makes it really useful for windows and for drinking glasses. Right? You, you don't want a, a drinking glass that leaks water. Right? So glass was used before the Romans, but they were the first to extensively develop this. Um, what they did is they added sodium carbonate to the silica, and that had the effect of dramatically reducing the melting point. 1,500 degrees Celsius is a very high temperature. That makes it very difficult to work with. You have to get a really good furnace and, and get things really hot, and then as, you know, as it cools down, it's, it's hard to work with. They also developed glass blowing, in which you take uh, melted glass on a tube and you blow it and you make spherical shapes. So the volumetric flasks that we've used in lab, those are made by blowing glass. Um, vitreous silica or fused silica is a glass made from um, silica. It's hard, it resists high temperatures, it has a low thermal expansion, meaning as you heat it, it doesn't expand very much. It's transparent to visible light and ultraviolet light. Um, this is just the silica, and so this is the high melting temperature, 1,500 degrees. It's too expensive for most applications because of that high temperature needed to produce it. Um, what we commonly call window glass is, is soda lime glass. And so this has about 70% silica, um, and the rest of it mostly being uh, sodium oxide and calcium oxide. Uh, it's transparent to visible light, but not ultraviolet light. And that's actually a benefit in some situations because it can protect you from sunburn. It does have a high thermal expansion. So when you heat it, it expands a lot, and then when it cools, it contracts a lot. And so that makes it, um, it, it tends to crack and break under thermal shock. So if you heat it and you cool it down too quickly, it'll, it'll just shatter. Um, but it's less expensive to make, and it's much easier to form into desirable shapes, like volumetric flasks. Yes? Should we study this? Like... That's a, I am not going to make you spit all this back at me. Okay. I mostly want you to, you know, if something comes up and you hear borosilicate glass, like, I remember hearing about that in chemistry class. So I'd like you to be paying attention in lecture. I'd like you to go back and read this, maybe take notes on it, but don't, don't memorize all of this. Yeah, it's more for, you should have heard about this if you take Chem 1A. It's a good question. 
<laughs> Just test you on the, the characteristics of glasses. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, not going to happen. So borosilicate glass, the, the uh, copyrighted name for that is Pyrex. This is made by adding boric oxide instead of calcium oxide in the, in the, sil in the soda lime glass. Um, this has a lower uh, heat expansion, so it expands less when heated, and thus can withstand heating and cooling cycles that would shatter soda lime glass. Most lab glassware is made of borosilicate glass. If you go home and you have like a 9 by 13 cake pan that's made out of glass, it's probably Pyrex, the brand, but it's definitely going to be a borosilicate glass. Because if you were to put soda lime glass in the oven and heat it up and take it out, it would probably shatter and there goes your casserole, right? Actually had an experience, um, not all lab glassware is Pyrex. You can get test tubes, the cheaper ones, because maybe you don't need to heat them, that are just soda lime glass. So I was doing an experiment with, with some students, and we had to heat a solid in a Bunsen burner flame. And I was just using the test tubes that they stuck out, and so just one after another, people's test tubes are shattering. I'm like, what the heck is going on? This isn't supposed to happen. They were soda lime glass instead of Pyrex. So, you know... This is one of those things that it's, it's useful to be aware there are different kinds of glass and they're useful in different situations. So most of our glassware, you can look at it when you're doing lab today, a lot of it will say Pyrex on it. And that's something that we can heat and cool. We can't be reckless with it. You don't want to get the, the beaker super hot, empty on a hot plate and then stick it in an ice water bath. That would probably be too much for it. But you could heat it with water and set it on the cool bench top, and it's going to be fine. Um, another type of glass is leaded glass. It's often uh, referred to as crystal. So you get married and you register for crystal, right? Well, that's what people used to do anyway. Um, leaded glass contains uh, lead oxide along with the silica and some other components. So that lead oxide in there gives it a much more brilliant appearance because it has a higher index of refraction. It bends light better. It also will make a ringing sound when tapped, whereas soda lime glass will not. Um, but people are understandably concerned about the presence of lead in things that they're drinking out of, right? So there's now available um, different forms of lead-free crystal that attempt to give you that brilliant appearance without the lead. Um, the presence of lead in, in the crystal is not necessarily dangerous. It depends on what you're using it for. If you've got a crystal wine glass and you're sipping wine during dinner, you're going to be fine. It takes time to leach lead out of leaded glass. If you're using a crystal decanter to s s store your scotch for two years, okay, I would not want to drink that scotch because it probably does have a significant amount of lead in it. Well, and, and the other thing about lead is lead tastes sweet. And so it, it tastes good, and that's why children chew on leaded paint surfaces because it tastes good. Um, but it's definitely not good for you. So just because something has lead in it does not mean it's necessarily going to kill you, right? We need to have some common sense. So any questions about those types of substances? Yeah. It's not good. It tastes like snuff. It's like, uh, 